time tonight. I know we have a minute or so left for more of our neighbors and friends to stop by for this wonderful program tonight. But I know perhaps our speaker this evening is very likely known to many of you. Um, I've had, and myself have had him speak at other libraries when I've worked there. Um, my name is Nicole Langley. I'm the director here at the Winchester Library. Um, this is Anthony Mori, our speaker for tonight. Um, if you are interested in art, in art history, and even the dark side, perhaps, of all of that, <laughs> um, you are really going to enjoy tonight's program. Um, so I wanted to thank you for coming and remind you, if um, you didn't know about our Friends of the Library, they're the organization that funds most of our programs, including this one this evening. So if you are a friend or if you'd like to become one, that's a wonderful idea and we'll have more programs like this. So without further waiting or chatting, um, I have our speaker this evening. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It wasn't, uh, you're supposed to clap at that point when she <laughs> says that. So, I'm just kidding. So I, I, uh, it's, not a, it's not a long trek from me because I live right here on Washington Street at a Winchester Green, the, tu the, tu the tutors there. And so, drive home from work, park at Jenks, because it's the winter, walk over here, do this, and I'll walk home tonight. Um, it's very easy, it's nice. So thank you for coming out. I've been in Winchester for uh, about four years now, and I'm still trying to get used to this overnight parking situation here. But. Uh, <laughs> I don't get it. I, uh, I was saying earlier that I, I was getting ticketed on my street every night uh, in December. So I said, I said, well, you know, I understand that you have to move or the pl but So I, I park in Jenks, but at 5.30 a.m. when I walk to get, to get my car, all the cars on the street aren't ticketed. So I park back on my street and I get ticketed. So I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But enough about that. I'll, I'll give that talk some other time. So. Um, Again, my name is Anthony Amari, and I, I am the director of security and the uh, chief investigator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I've been there for over 18 years now. And um, I always like to make a point of telling groups that I'm the chief investigator, because I'm really the only investigator, too. So <laughs> I'd like to be able to flaunt that title. Um, because when you've been looking for missing art for 18 plus years, and you haven't found it, you need to find small ways to satisfy yourself. So <laughs> I talk at libraries and call myself chief investigator. But, um, so I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book. And the, the mission of speaking to you tonight is to, I, I give this talk a lot. I've been giving it, I've been giving it to um, audiences around the world, uh, to, uh, including police officers and prosecutors and people who are interested in art and avid readers. Um, but my mission, the reason I wrote this book, and the reason that I like to talk about it is because of the misconceptions people have about art theft and, and who commits it and why and what becomes of the works and so on. And it's an important mission because when I started at the Gardner Museum in 2005, you know, I, I started as somebody who um, worked in anti-terrorism my whole career. So I was with the federal government for almost 15 years. And, um, oh good, I have some neighbors coming. This is great. So I, um, I just want to let them come in. Yep. So Tina, I already complained about the parking situation, so I, sp no I spared you that, okay. I'm taking care of it. So I, I, as I was saying, I'm sorry, I, I worked in, in trying to prevent terrorism for 15 years of my career. I worked with, the, you remember the INS, the Immigration Service, and, then I was a federal agent with an agency called FAA Security. And then after the attacks of 9-11, I was assistant director building security back up at Logan Airport um, following the attacks. You, you probably remember this. I like talking to audiences that are my age or older because I don't have to explain things. So you remember in two th after 9-11, we had to rebuild security there primarily because the two aircraft that struck the Twin Towers left from Logan Airport. So it was a big spotlight airport. And I did that for five years, and we got everything up running the way I thought it would be sufficient to protect the public. And on a Sunday 
morning, I was leafing through the Boston Globe, and I wasn't looking for a job, but in the classified section, I saw security director at Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And first of all, you guys remember there used to be jobs in the newspaper. Like, that's how, that's how people looked. I wasn't looking for one, but I saw this. And what struck me about the uh, job announcement was that I knew the Gardner had been the place where this giant heist had taken place, but it was this little ad, and it was like between service counter at Pep Boys and secretary <laughs> or something, and I was like, this is how they're going to go about. So I applied because I wanted to meet the people there. And it's a quirky place, and I'm, I'm not surprised by that ad now. But when I inter how many of you have never been to the Gardner Museum? One, two, wow. Oh. No excuse, folks, no excuse. Thir 13 miles from here. I know it takes me about 90 minutes in the morning, but it's 13 miles from here, so I hope this convinces you to go. Um, when I went, so many of you know the courtyard, which is like, you know, the, the jaw dropper, and that's where I was interviewed, right at the courtyard. And I had primarily been at Logan Airport for 15 years, and I'm like, I can look at this place every day instead, you know? And, um, after some negotiations, of course, I decided to take the job. So when I started, I had to make this big leap from terrorism realm to art theft. And I had to you know, start looking for these stolen paintings. And I'm a data type person, and this is what we did in Homeland Security. Um, I started collecting, you can't hear me? It's a little soft, right? It's, it's a little soft? Some of us in the back are Okay, maybe I'll come closer. I'll come closer. So, so, um, lost my train of thought. So I started collecting all the data I could get my hands on, right? I built a database with the mission of looking at every art heist for the last hundred years, putting them into this database that I built, and analyzing who steals art, why, what becomes of it, how. heist that you, that you can imagine to try to build a profile. And the first thing I learned about art theft that I didn't know before is that it is such an enormous problem that looking at all of the heist for the last hundred years would be time prohibitive. I could never start working because it, there's so much art theft. It's a multi-billion dollar per year illicit industry. It's massive, right? So that was the first big lesson for me. Who knew? Right, I thought it happens like once every five years, some museum gets robbed, it's constant. And it never really changes, pretty flat line over the last century. So I said, I'm gonna focus on Rembrandt because we lost three Rembrandts during the Godner heist in 1990. So I figured, well, let me focus on him. And that was a really important lesson too because what I found was that Rembrandt is the most often stolen artist when you look at number of works he created. Right? And what I learned pretty fast, because part of my orientation too was to go out and talk to criminals. So I go out and interview art thieves, and I go out and interview people who commit crimes against museums and, su and such. And one of the things I learned is that the reason Rembrandt is targeted so much is because that's who everybody knows, right? So if we went over to um, Winchester High School to a freshman class and said, how many of you have heard of Rembrandt? <laughs> They'd all raise their hand. That doesn't mean they can identify Rembrandt or tell you about him, but they've all heard of Rembrandt, right? Now, if I said to them, how many of you have heard of Mark Rothko, whose works are worth millions of dollars as well? No hands would go up, maybe a couple. This is Winchester, so maybe somebody here has one, right? <laughs> so, um, and that's why Rembrandt gets targeted, because it's the people who steal art are not art experts. That's the movies, right? And everything I learned in this research tells me that the movies are not accurate. What you see in Hollywood is not accurate, but that's what the public believes, and with good reason, because I'm, I joked about Winchester, but how many of you have had a multi-million dollar painting stolen from your home, right? So how would you know, except from movies? So my friend Bev is gonna hit the buttons. Thank is God you came. Focused? Next slide, yeah. Is it focused? I don't know, okay. I, don't, I don't know how to do that. You'll get the point. So, this is Hollywood's version, right? On the right, you see Thomas Crown. That's the one everyone always refers to. Whenever I meet somebody new and I say what I do for a living, they say, oh, like the Thomas Crown Affair. And I say, no, nothing like the Thomas Crown Affair. In fact, I only saw that movie relatively recently, and nothing in it 
at all resembles real life. Nothing, zero. It's, it's comical, but it's not meant to be, you know, it's not high drama. It's kind of like a fun movie, but there's nothing about that that's real life, okay? Now, we're good, we're good just for a sec. So in the top left-hand corner, it's a little blurry, but some of you might recognize that scene. That's um, Catherine Zeta-Jones in the movie Entrapment. It's, uh, she's in this film with Sean Connery, and he's teaching her how to be an art thief. Has anybody seen that movie? And in this image here, he has her blindfolded, and she's working her way through those red laser beams that you use for motion sensors in museums. And that's, that's a great illustration because we don't use red laser beams in museums. It's ridiculous, right? Why would, we, why would we have motion sensors that the bad guys can see and work their way around, right? And the other strange thing about this is I'm still working on this database I started telling you about. Still working on it. I have something like 1,500 heists in it. And not one time in history did the, did the thieves wear a blindfold, right? So that doesn't make any sense either. Now, on the bottom here, many of you might remember this show. It, um, it Takes a Thief, remember that with Robert Wagner? Before he, you know, some people might just know him now from reverse mortgage commercials and things like that, but he used to play a cat burglar. And the character's name, does anybody remember the character's name? Al Mundy, okay. And he was like what Hollywood always depicts, incredibly handsome guy, smart, witty, wearing the black turtleneck and dressed really well. And then when he did a heist, he would come in through the skylight and hang over the item, you know, with the balakava on, just like Tom Cruise or something. Of course, that's not what really happens. But he's an, import he's an important figure here, Al Mundy, because, the next slide, please. This guy, his name is Florian Mundy. And Florian Mundy lived out in uh, Worcester, Bellingham area. And he was such a thief, he was a committed thief, that was his job, that people stopped calling him Florian and started calling him Al, like the TV show. So he, for the rest of his life, went by Al Monday. Now, he's, he is the mastermind of a major heist, the biggest heist in history at the time, 1972. And one of the, the interesting things that you will all find from this lecture is that the three most important art heists in my research, in my estimation, all occurred in Massachusetts, right? Because everything bad happens here, <laughs> crime-wise. And the three most important heists happen here. Um, and the first one is this, 1972, the Worcester Art Museum. Has anybody been to the Worcester Art Museum? A few? Okay, good. So it's a nice museum, right? So you, it, it, you know, it's in Worcester, I get that, but it's a nice museum, <laughs> and it has a nice collection. And um, Al is unusual in the realm of art crime because he graduated from college. He went to Providence College. And usually the people who steal art are, are high school dropouts, and they're just career criminals. And that's the most important lesson, right, is that people who steal art are not specialists. They're not master thieves. That's not true. They're career criminals who do everything else, and then they say, let me try to steal art. That's what happened with Al. So Al was stealing cars and guns and doing home invasions. And some of you might know what a fence is, but for those of you who don't, a fence is a person who's essentially the middleman. If you steal something, the fence is the person who's going to sell it for you. And your take is going to be about 10%. That's a rule of thumb. So if Al stole a car back then worth $2,500, he was going to get $250, which is not going to give him the lifestyle he thinks he deserves. Many of these guys who do this have this grandiose uh, vision of themselves. Believe it or not, a number of them tried to become rock and roll stars, too, because they love the big stage. Al did. He put out a record in the late 60s. His band was called Florian and the Mondos. And uh, on YouTube, you can find the single, the single he released, as a matter of fact. So he says he's taken a course. He, this is what he told me. He was taking a course at Assumption College, and one day, he, as he walked out, he saw the Worcester Art Museum in front of him, and that prompted him to think about stealing paintings. He's thinking, if I steal something worth millions and I get 10%, that's the sort of payday I want, right? And Al is, loves to embellish, because you might know Assumption College is not across the street from the Worcester Art Museum, but nevertheless, he starts going to the museum, and he starts looking at what he thinks 
would be the most valuable works to steal. And there's another important lesson for you. Many times people think, oh, it's a, you know, some, some collector somewhere must have wanted this painting, that's why it was stolen. That's not why paintings are stolen. They're not for some collector who wants it for his private collection. That never happens. Paintings are stolen because of value. People assume this is the most valuable painting here, I'm gonna steal it, right? Now, Al does something that is really a, a great illustration for you as to why art gets stolen frequently. I want you to think about it. And I've interviewed more of these thieves than you can count, right? And here's, here's it in a nutshell. If you want to steal valuables, you can steal diamonds, right? So you have to think about risk and reward. How hard is it to steal something? How easy is it to fence it, right? So take jewels. Very easy to fence. If you steal valuable jewels, you can sell them no problem. They're not going to be traced, OK? Stealing them is hard. And some of you might notice now, if you go to a jewelry store, right, or even in the past, if they put stuff out in front of you, there might be an armed guard. And that guard might be right near you. You don't mind because it's a jewelry store, right? And the stuff's right in front of you. Hard to steal, easy to fence. But they don't steal jewels that often because it's too risky. So what else is there? There's cash. Easy to fence, you just use it. Very hard to steal. So when you see a news story that a, a, a bank has been robbed, yeah, it happens often, but the guys get away with like 2,500 bucks if they're lucky, okay? Art, on the other hand, think about it. It's this fortress, a museum, right? But it's the most egalitarian place you can imagine because we put this priceless stuff out there with the goal of having you come and see it. And you can walk up to a painting, I have no idea what the value of this is, but imagine it's really valuable and it's in a museum. It's, and, I can, and I can stand here, and the museum wants me to stand here and just stare at it, right? Now Al would go to the Worcester Art Museum and do that, but he wasn't looking at the art, he was looking at how is it hung to the wall, where are the security cameras, where are the guards, are the guards armed? that sort of thing, right? He's casing the place in broad daylight because museums are built, sorry, but they're built to be cased as well as enjoyed, okay? So he doesn't go, and his favorite artist was Renoir. He doesn't go and look for Renoir. They have Renoir at the Worcester Art Museum, but he goes and looks for what he thinks are the most valuable, and he chooses four. Two paintings by Gauguin, a painting by Picasso, and of course, a Rembrandt, okay? So he plans this heist. Al is a pretty smart guy, and one of the clever things about his plan is that he's not gonna steal the paintings. He's gonna get a couple of flunkies that do stuff for him, because they're career criminals. These guys in their very early 20s, and have them go do it. So he gets them, they're happy to do it. They do, they do crime, you know, every week they're doing a major crime. And Al goes over the heist with them. Next slide, please. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> he knows he needs a station wagon because the, one of the Gauguins is very big and won't fit into the back seat easily, okay? For those of you who are younger than me, that's a compact station wagon in 1972, right? That's what they all looked like, right? That's a beach wagon. And that's, you need a big one like this because that's where the painting would fit. The Gauguin brooding woman would fit in the back. They steal the car as easily as you came here tonight. It's just what you do, right? They're thieves. On the appointed day in May 1972, the two thieves come to Al's house. He goes over the plan one more time with them. It's going to be broad daylight. The heist is going to happen just after noon. And people are surprised to hear that, but most museum heists happen during the day for the very reason I explained to you. The place is open. 50% of your job is done. You can get right to the painting. You don't have to break in, okay? He talks to the two guys. They go over the plan again, and he gives them both blue windbreakers to wear because his supposition is that visitors who might think that, that these two thieves work there because they're dressed the same won't interfere. They'll see the painting being taken down, and they'll think it's workers, right? Has anyone here been to a museum when a painting was being taken off the wall? Have you ever seen that? Good, because that would be a theft, right? <laughs> we don't take paintings down when the museum's open. So 
put, they put the jackets on, and Al says, okay, car's right outside, go, go at it, and they won't go. And he says, what's the problem? And they say, where's our gun? And Al's taken aback by this. There's no gun in our plan. We've been over this and over this, and you've seen the guards. All the guards are el elderly, retired men, <laughs> slight of build. They're not armed. You're two young, tough guys. You don't need a gun, and they refuse to do it without the gun. Al wants his painting, so he goes into his bedroom, to his nightstand, and just like most of us, he has a stolen revolver in there, right? That's, a, that's what you keep in your nightstand. He gets the revolver, he gives it to them, they're happy, they walk outside, they look inside, no bullets. Empty gun. They go back inside, the same sort of back and forth ensues. Al gives them one bullet. And one, Al, Al has passed away, but one thing I'll always remember is him telling me, he held out the bullet, and when they reached for it, he pulled it back, and he said, don't put blood on my paintings. And what he meant by that was figuratively, because he understood. So 1972, if you committed a big art heist, it's a big story, not like it would be now, okay? And it wouldn't get the big police response you would now. But if you shoot somebody in the commission of a heist, now we're talking about the cavalry coming out, right? And so, of course not, we're not gonna shoot anybody, we know the rules, so next slide, please. So the two thieves go to the museum. It's early in the afternoon, just after noon. They pull into the circular drive at the entrance and just park this big station wagon there. And they go right inside. Now, this is the Renaissance uh, Hall in, in the Worcester Art Museum. This is a modern photo. The Worcester Art Museum has one of the world's best collections of Antioch mosaics, believe it or not. Like, who would guess? But they do. And they have this beautiful one here in the center. And in 1972, it didn't have rails around it. So that's changed. And one other thing has changed. By the side of the stairs, using my shadow there. Here, there was a bench. So the two thieves walk in. They head, head to the stairs because the paintings are on the second floor. Now, when Al gave them instructions and then when they went over this, he told them a number of times, just like in The Godfather, just like when Michael, had, you've all seen The Godfather, I suppose, when Michael Corleone has to go shoot the police captain, the guy Clemenza trains him and he says, when you do it, don't look anybody in the eye, but don't look away either. Don't run out of the room, but don't walk either. The goal is not to do anything that will distinguish you, right? You want to be as unmemorable as you can be. Got it. They go in, they're heading up the stairs, that bench is there. There are two high school seniors, girls, particularly attractive. These guys are in their early 20s. Girls are standing there, they stop, and they say to the girls, you might want to sit over here, something big's going to happen, right? <laughs> so of course, of course that goes against, that flies in the face of what Al told them, but that's what they did, right? So they go up the stairs with their jackets on and they take the four paintings that Al has pointed out. And just like Al expected, nobody said a word to them, right? Which is amazing to me, but nobody said a word. In fact, Al had his sister-in-law sew these velvet bags to put the paintings in. And these guys were taking paintings off the walls, putting them in these velvet bags. Nobody said a word to them. They walked back down the stairs, and as they're leaving, they walk onto the mosaic. At the entrance is a guard, and he sees them, and he tells them to stop. Get off the mosaic, he tells them. Then he notices that they're carrying paintings, thank God, and as they get closer, and he grabs the paintings. And the thieves figure he, he you know, he's slowing them down, so they take out the gun and they shoot him. And they shoot him, and it's a serious injury. It's near his hip. He hits the floor, he's bleeding profusely. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard a gun being fired without ear protection on. It's memorable. It's piercing, right? You, your ears are ringing for an hour. Imagine that in this room, this big cement and marble room, the echo. People hit the floor. People are screaming. Fortunately for the guard, he had just then been giving directions to a nurse who was visiting, and she saved his life. The thieves just walk right out, right by the guard, with their four paintings. The driver gets behind the wheel. His cohort takes three of the smaller ones and puts them in the back seat. And you remember I told you why they took the station wagon? He takes the big Gauguin painting and puts it on the roof and holds it like this, <laughs> right? So hopefully you're, you're starting to get the idea that this is not the Thomas Crown affair, right? This is not Mission Impossible. These are, 
dunderheads who are criminals. Nevertheless, they make off with the paintings. They, they bring the paintings to Al's house in Worcester. They get rid of the getaway car, and they go to the local bar where they hang out. Right? That's what they do. They're going to have a couple of drinks to celebrate, but it's not like, to them, it's not the world's biggest theft at the time. To them, it's another job. But they're happy. They made it. So they go to this bar. It's about 2.30, I think, and the place is packed because it's Worcester, right? <laughs> so they sit down, and they have a couple of drinks. And while they're having these drinks, on the television, a couple of TVs in the place, breaking news comes up. Now, many of you in this room remember that there was a time when if the news, if the TV said breaking news, it meant news was breaking, right? Because now every show says breaking news at the bottom. But this really meant something. And I remember as a young man, like if you saw that, your stomach would sink because it meant like we were firing rockets at some country or someone famous had died or something really bad had happened. And that's the environment that this is taking place in. So the guys are in the bar and the people hush, and then a local anchor comes on the TV. So now everybody's really paying attention. He says, breaking news out of Worcester. The Worcester Art Museum has been robbed. Um, two thieves are armed and dangerous. They've escaped. A guard is in critical condition. He's been rushed to the hospital. Rembrandt and Picasso and Gauguin have been stolen. The FBI and the Worcester police are on scene. Details at six. So. You can imagine this bar, this neighborhood bar, it places buzzing, right? And everyone starts talking about who could have done this. We, we might even know who did it. And the two thieves are sitting right there. Of course, they see it too. And they go, hey, that was us. <laughs> they say, this, this, again, it's a true story. I'm not, this is a nonfiction book. So has anybody here been in, in law enforcement or an investigator? Or I know you have, right? So you'll agree with me. I've been in investigations for 33 years now. That's a good lead, right? If so, <laughs> when people admit in front of their community that they've just committed a major heist and they're career criminals, you should probably act on it. And the police did. And they arrested the thieves. And the police know Al Monday is their boss. But Al's not there, right? So they go to Al's house. And they knock on the door. And he opens. And of course, he won't let them in. And he tells them to leave. And um, they have to go home and dot their I's and cross their T's and try to make a case and find these paintings. This, this is you know, the bane of my existence as the, as the investigator for the Godner. You can, you, you'll hear me say this again. You can locate the thieves, but locating the paintings is an entirely different thing, right? It's, it's, it, the two things don't mesh all the time. So next slide, please, Beth. Thanks. This is the Rembrandt that was stolen. It's called St. Bartholomew. Rembrandt painted St. Bartholomew, I'm sorry it's so dark, but Rembrandt painted St. Bartholomew three times that we know of. And in each painting, St. Bartholomew is posed in a similar fashion. And in each one, you definitely can't see it here, but in each of the paintings, Rembrandt is holding a flaying knife. That's, that's what's, this is his hand here, and he's holding a flaying knife. And that's because the great masters would paint martyred saints holding or standing by or with some representation of the instrument of their martyrdom. And St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. And that's why he's holding a flaying knife. And as a personal aside, from grades one through eight, I went to St. Bartholomew's school in Providence. And first grade, Sister Martina told us, your patron saint was skinned alive at the stake. And when you're six years old, that sticks with you. So I always... <laughs> I always remember St. Bartholomew. That's what we did. That's, that's what Catholics do, right? So anyway, <laughs> this painting is amazing. Now, if you've seen the movie uh, American Hustle with Christian Bale and Bradley Cooper, Amy Adams, it starts with this painting. And they're in the Worcester Art Museum. And uh, one of the characters is saying it's a fake. And he's talking about a con job in the art world. But it is not a fake. It's absolutely beautiful. And what I love to tell audiences is, this isn't a good image, but if you have a favorite painting that you've not seen in person, you've not seen it, right? There's a world of difference between the best, highest resolution slide and the actual painting, right? It's an indescribable difference in one of the things, especially about Rembrandt, you can only get in person, is that it's mesmerizing that his portraits, 
The light comes from the subject. I don't know how he does it. It was easy for him. But when you look at them, the light's emanating from the person. You can't get that in a slide, right? So Al has this painting, very, very valuable. And he's got to hide these four paintings, right? Because he knows the police are on to him. And in the movies, you expect that these paintings are in some vault in Switzerland, or they're behind a bookcase, and you pull the handle, and the bookcase turns around. But he brought these paintings to, to uh, Johnston, Rhode Island, to the Pachillo Pig Farm, which was the most polluted place in the United States. It was the first EPA Superfund site. And he hid these paintings in a hayloft at a polluted pig farm in Johnston, Rhode Island that was controlled by the mob. Right? So now you see the police have the guys who did it. But how in the world are they going to find paintings in a hayloft at a pig farm? So they're conducting their investigations. This news story is worldwide, because it's the biggest heist of its day. And when I was first started researching this database I told you about, believe it or not, I used to have to use microfiche. Do you remember microfiche? Because this stuff wasn't online 2005 when I first started. Microfiche. So when I speak to colleges, the students have no clue what I'm talking about when I say microfiche. But it was front page worldwide. And it's front page in Worcester. So at the time, there were these two thieves who were out on bail awaiting sentencing on this violent armed home invasion. Right? And you wonder, why were they on bail, out on bail? Well, it was Massachusetts in the 1970s, so of course they're out on bail. So they know they're going to get sentenced harshly, and they need to, to like curry favor with the judge. So what they do, they see the newspaper, and they say, we know it's Al Monday. They go to Monday's house, and they do what the cops couldn't do. When he opens the door, they just put a gun in his stomach and said, take us to the paintings. And he takes them to the paintings. They drive to Johnston. Get, they get the paintings. The, uh, the thieves turn them into the judge. And the judge gives them a tiny little break. And it's, a, it's like a movie scene. The people erupt in the courthouse. And these guys feel that they've been used. But tough luck. So the, next slide, please. These are the thieves. I put those yellow arrows for you. But you, can't, you might not be able to make it out. I love these period police photos, crime photos. Because this guy in the front. He has just shot a guard. He had just essentially attempted murder in the commission of a robbery. And the police handcuff him in front, cigarette, no problem, just walk him in. Nowadays, they'd be like you know, snipers, and he'd be, you know. But that, those are the two guys. And next slide, please. And this is, this is the paintings when they come back. So um, in this picture, this is the Picasso woman and child. That's the big Gauguin that should have been in the back of the station wagon. And this is a smaller Gauguin. And in the back, you could see uh, the Rembrandt. And it, um, there's no frame. And uh, what happened was Al Monday, excuse me, Al Monday felt that the frame was weighing him down. It's bizarre. And he took the wooden frame off and threw it in the Blackstone River. Um, so when it comes back, next slide, please. The museum put it in this ornate frame, which is not really a Dutch frame. The original photo I showed you, a, a Dutch frame would be a dark, wooden, s more simple frame. But they put it in this ornate frame. And this is the ceremony they had when it came back a, a few months later. And uh, Phil Evans is the guard who was shot. So he was there for the return of the paintings, and he was in good health for that. So this is an important heist. And the reason I think it's one of the world's most important thefts is because not only does it illustrate to you that you steal these paintings with the goal of selling them in your experienced thief with all these fences at your fingertips, but when you steal something that's this recognizable and this valuable, nobody wants to touch it, right? So when these things get stolen, they don't get sold. So I can't tell you how many people call me every week telling me who they think bought the stolen Gardner paintings. I can tell them they, didn't, they were never sold. But people know that from the movies, right? The other reason this is really historically significant is because the first time in history that a museum is uh, um, robbed at, uh, by armed thieves at gunpoint. Right? So Massachusetts, you can sit up nice and proud in your chair. It's the home of uh, armed robberies. <laughs> Al was very proud of this. He, was, he would go on TV and talk about how it was his idea. 
as if no one would have ever dreamt to rob a place at gunpoint, right? But that, that's why it's important, it's the first one. So next slide, please. So three years later, there's another armed robbery. And it takes place here at the MFA. Now the MFA is, is that, is that um, mid-level museum across the street from the Gardner Museum, right? So <laughs> it's the second nicest museum on the Fenway, I like to say. So the reason I show this overhead view is because you see the Fenway, it, it's one way at that point. So you see it's a circular drive, it's a one-way road, and if you pull off a heist in the afternoon, just like they did in Worcester, there's no Red Sox game, there's no traffic. If you just have like a 30 second head start on the police, they are not going to catch you because from there, you can go all four directions onto the highway, right? It's a great getaway. So what happens is a van pulls into the circular drive, and two guys get out. Just before the van pulled into that drive, a car breaks down on this end to our left of the Fenway, so it really uh, inhibits the flow of traffic. Two guys get out of the van, they go into the museum, and you know that entrance with the big baby heads? Yeah. There's a ticket booth, uh, ticket counter there? It wasn't there at the time. There's a glass wall on a ticket counter now, but it was open. So the two thieves walk right in there, and they go to the second floor as well. Okay. Yeah, earn that book. And uh, I'm just kidding. So they go up to this painting, and it's called here, um, it's cut off, it's Girl with the Fur Trim Cloak by Rembrandt. Now, in 1975, it was thought to be Rembrandt's sister, so it was titled Portrait of Elsbeth Van Rijn, but it was not. So some of you might know there's a thing called the Rembrandt Research Project, and it's this group of Rembrandt scholars that go around and, and look at Rembrandt paintings and say, no, nah, that's actually not him, because the turn of the last century, there was something like 2,000 Rembrandt paintings in America, and they're there are not 2,000 Rembrandt paintings in the world, right? So this group would look at them and say, actually, that's not. But when they got to this one, uh, and it's not owned by the MFA, it's a, it was on loan to the MFA by Robert Treat Payne's family. When they got to this one, they said, it's not Elsbeth Van Rijn, it's a portrait study. However, it's as good an example of Rembrandt's handiwork as there is. And sometimes it's used to compare other works to when they're trying to attribute his paintings. Rembrandt did this portrait of this woman and a, a, a profile portrait. It's on an oak panel, an oval oak panel, and it is absolutely magnificent, right? So it's hard to get images of this painting because it's privately owned. The MFA gave me this high-res digital image of it, but when I saw it for the first time in person, it was in North Carolina on a special exhibition, and I am not exaggerating when I tell you, I, I came over, I turned around, and you felt, I felt my knees buckle because it's that unbelievable a painting. And I come from Homeland Security background, right? I'm not an art history major. I'm not, I wouldn't have believed that, that a painting would have that effect on me, but it does, right? So they go up to this painting and they pull it off the wall. And while one guy's pulling on it, two guards come over and these are two tough guys. They just push the guards aside. They're elderly gentlemen. They just, you know, make quick use of these guys, push them away, take the painting, go back out the way they came. But before they leave the museum in that atrium area, they fire warning shots. They don't have one bullet. They've got serious weaponry, and they fire warning shots. And again, people hear this echoing, and people are horrified in the museum. They run down the stairs and they turn and they fire at the staircase in case anybody wants to be a hero, right? And then this guy here, next slide please. George Monkowski is a security guard at the MFA. That's a security guard's hat. They sort of dress like police. He was a retired Boston police officer, unarmed. In spite of the gunfire, he runs at the shooters to get the painting, which is, sounds crazy, right? But people who work in museums or who love art abandon common sense and try to save paintings, and I get that. So even at the Gardner, when I wrote the emergency plan, in the emergency plan, if there's a fire, you have to leave the museum. Do not try to save paintings. You have to keep saying that over and over, but it's useless because people will try, including me. You can't just leave the building. You know you want to save a painting, right? He felt that kinship with a work of art. He gets close enough that as the guy's getting in the van, he grabs this 
oak panel, and there's a tug of war. And one of the guys in the van has a machine gun, and he puts it to his head, and he's going to kill him. But the mastermind who just left the museum says, don't shoot him, don't shoot, because he knows what will happen if you shoot a guy, just like Worcester. So they don't shoot him, they just smash him in the head, and he's showing his injury to the photographer here. And the thieves make the getaway. And the van goes, and there's a cloud of smoke, and no one has the slightest clue who stole it, why, where they went with it. There's no forensic evidence, and there's no leads. It's just gone. And the MFA is not like the Gardner Museum. We don't have to, you know, we, they can put other things in its place. So the MFA has something like a half a million works in storage. And they took another piece, put it in its place, and life went on. Insurance company was researching it, but life went on. Next slide. This guy's name is Miles Connor. Has anybody ever heard of Miles Connor? I knew you. I knew you would know. I knew you would have heard. But oh, so you danced with where at the Beachcomber? Beach where? I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> so Miles, as you might know, is was a rock and roller as well. Very famous rock and roller. He was. They called him the pri the president of rock and roll, and he was a, 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 a headlining attraction around the state. He's also the greatest art thief who ever lived. And he's from Milton, Massachusetts, because remember my rule of thumb about Massachusetts, right? <laughs> Always something here. In 1973, Miles and some of his friends heard there was art to be stolen at the Woolworth Estate in Monmouth, Maine. And how did they hear this? Well, a few months earlier, the Woolworth Estate had been robbed, and the newspapers talked about what was stolen and what was left behind. So these thieves said, there's more there. So they went up there with Miles, and they steal all the silver they can carry. They steal two Simon Willard grandfather clocks. They steal um, furniture. And Miles, who can't help himself, steals three works by the Wyatts. Now, Miles knows you can't sell these things. He knows the lesson I'm telling you. But he's a risk taker and does not care, and he's an art lover. He's, one of the, he's the outlier. He knows art. Right? He's a member of Mensa, career criminal, most amazing criminal in the state's history. They take these paintings, and Miles knows he can't sell them. But one day, he hears word that there's a guy named Bernie Murphy who's interested in buying some stolen art. Miles has a show at this club at a strip mall on the Cape. So Miles tells this guy, I'll bring the art, meet me before the show, and we'll see if you're interested in it. So they do. And Miles opens the trunk and shows this guy what he's got. He's got these Wyatts. The guy says, this is what I'm looking for. Miles gives, gives him a price. They go back and forth. They agree. And the, the buyer, Bernie, takes out his wallet and hands Miles his FBI badge. Because there are no buyers for these things, OK? Because it's Massachusetts, Miles, at the time, is out on bail on a state charge for art theft when he's arrested selling more stolen art. This time, the FBI has him on a task force. Now he knows right away, federal charge, state charge, they're going to try to get consecutive sentences. The, the FBI agent says to him, we got you now, Connor. Let's see you get out of this one. And he's in the car, handcuffed, and he says, well, just you watch me. And the state trooper says to him, oh, yeah, well, it's going to take you a Rembrandt to get out of this one. So Miles, Miles went and stole this painting from the MFA. That's who took this in 1975. The guy put it in his head. You know, so Miles had this idea, well, if I steal this Rembrandt, maybe I'll get out of trouble. So he steals it, and it's hidden under one of his friend's mother's bed. Right? His mother has no idea that every night when she goes to bed, there's this priceless Rembrandt portrait underneath her bed, because her son hid it there for Miles Connor. Um, Miles gets word out to the authorities that he didn't do it, but he might know someone who can get them back. And they set up this real clandestine return operation. And the paintings returned, and Miles gets con uh, concurrent sentences and a very short term. I think he wound up serving about three years 
on all of these art heists. And the reason this is so important is because it really set the precedent. Now, people use art as a get out of jail free card very often. They steal it for money 99.9% .9 of the time. When they can't sell it, they don't just give it back because Miles taught them, not intentionally, but you can use it as a chit with the prosecutors. So that's what makes it very, very hard to find. But the silver lining, if there is one, is that this is why it doesn't get destroyed. People always think, well, maybe the paintings got destroyed. They don't get destroyed. Thieves hold on to them. Next slide. So it doesn't only happen in Massachusetts. This portrait of, um, what was his name again? Jacob de Guyne the third. That's not what we call this painting. We call it the takeaway Rembrandt, right? Because it was stolen four times from the Dulwich Picture Gallery in Great Britain, four times. The first time it was stolen by a guy they called the rubber bone thief because he cut a hole in the wooden door, a small hole. You can go to the next slide, actually. Climbs through that hole, steals nine paintings that'll fit back out the door, the hole in the door, including two Rembrandts, Jacob de Guyne being one of them. Now, from a security perspective, I can understand why he went in that way, but I don't know why he didn't just open the door on his way out and he climbed back <laughs> through that hole, but that's what he did. And this is the detective the next morning saying, hey, boss, I think I know how they got in. That's what that, that's what that photo is. But um, they, he was caught, and then it was stolen again in 1966 by a, a, a mentally disturbed person who just took it off the wall, put it in his bicycle basket, and started riding home with it and the police caught up with them. It's, it sounds like, like a Abbott and Costello movie. The police pull up and he's riding his bike and they say, what are you, what are you doing with the painting? He goes, I'm just taking it home to draw it, to, to sketch it. So they got it again and then it was stolen twice in the 1980s by these criminal gangs who thought they could monetize it but could not and they just gave it back, right? So the painting has been stolen four times, the most often stolen painting in the world. That's why they call it the takeaway Rembrandt. Next slide. In the 1930s, this painting by Rembrandt called Saskia at Her Toilet was stolen with 18 other paintings from this gigantic castle in Great Britain, and the thieves made off with these paintings. One of the members of the gang panicked and told the police what had happened. The rest of the gang members panicked as well, and they burned this one. The only one, but they burned it, right? So it's the only Rembrandt in history that I can find that was destroyed coming up on 100 years ago, but it gives you a sense of what an awful crime it is, right? Because that's the best image you're ever going to see of this painting, which is nothing, right? That's useless. And our former museum director at the Gardner Museum often said that um, when this, something like this happens, it's like imagine Hamlet being taken out of the public canon. Imagine you can never read it or hear it or see it. It's just what's in your memory. It's the same thing, right? And it just degrades over time. Next, we're gonna skip this next slide and go. So this is the Gardner Museum for the five of you, I think, who have never been there, which is gonna change, right, before the, before the winter's over. Um, that's not a good, that's the, that, you're not getting a good sense of it there, but that's the famous courtyard, right? And many of you might have heard the story before, but just in a nutshell, first of all, there's, I know there's a lot of documentaries. And has anybody seen a documentary on Netflix about the Gardner theft? You have? Yeah. Don't bother, because I, I didn't watch it, but I didn't participate in it either. And so they didn't have access. We have, the FBI and I have a, a case file that's something like, it's somewhere around 70,000 pages of case file. And um, none of it was accessible to the documentary makers, right? So they, I guess they do their best, but I don't, I don't watch or listen to those things. But um, the true story is that it's 1.24 in the morning on March 18th. So it's St. Patrick's Day turning into the next day, right? Parties are winding down. We, at the time, we had two overnight guards. One of them is upstairs doing his rounds. And they, they're not even there because they're worried about theft. Usually, they're observing report guards. He's walking around fire, water, any sort of odd damage to art. That's the main reason he's doing rounds. The other one is sitting at the watch desk. So the watch desk is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a long desk by, the, by what was the employee entrance at the time. And at 124, these two police officers approach that door and they hit, hit the intercom 
and say into the intercom, Boston police were responding to a disturbance in the compound. And the guard behind the desk buzzes them in based on that, right? So we, have a, we, we do now, and back then, we have a sally port. So the first door opens, you walk in, it closes, the second door. So if you make a mistake, you can catch them. But he let them in both doors against policy and against protocol, right? The, in training, he was trained and this is no big secret, if the police come and you haven't called them in the middle of the night, all you do is call the police. It's a fail safe, right? Because the police are gonna say, oh, we sent him, it's fine. Or they're gonna say, don't let him in, we're on our way. But he just let them in. And once these two guys came in, it was a fait accompli. There was no way of stopping them, right? It was over. They come in and one guy stands off to the left by the stairs to the basement and one guy does all the talking. Can you bring up the next slide, please? The guy who did all the talking would be the one on the left with the more narrow face. And I'll get into these drawings in a second. He says to the kid behind the desk, and, and I, call every, I call anyone younger than me kids, so no offense to, to this guy, but he says to him, you know, we're responding to a disturbance in the court, in the compound. Is there anything going on that you want to tell us about? The kid says, no, not that I'm aware of. The cop says, anybody else working with you tonight? And he says, yeah, one other guy. So he says, well, all right, get him down here. So he radios for his partner. It takes him about 30 seconds to get there, right? Once he's down, once the second guard is there, the police officer says to the kid behind the desk, you look familiar to me. Do I know you from somewhere? And the guard says, I don't think so. And he says, well, let me see your ID. The kid hands him his driver's license and his work ID. And the cop looks at it and says, yeah, there's a warrant out for you. Come out from behind that desk and the kid does. So now the two guards are away from the only contact with the outside world, which would be a telephone, but more importantly, a hidden duress button, just like banks would have or anybody else would have. They're away from that now. Once they're away from it, the police officer says, you two, you're under arrest, assume the position. And you might remember from old cop shows, that meant stand up against the wall. I don't know why they don't say that anymore, but that's what they used to say. And so they stand up against the wall and the police handcuff them. And once they have the handcuffs on them, they say, gentlemen, this is a robbery. Uh, we're not here to harm you. Don't put up a fight. We're just here to steal, steal the art. Don't, don't resist. And the kid who let them in says, they don't pay us enough to put up a fight. And it's kind of a, a, a sassy thing to say, right? But he's right. So these are not Navy SEALs. These are two music students in their early 20s, right? They're not supposed to put up a fight. They would have been hurt very badly. The thieves never, never brandished weapons, but they were dressed as police officers. So once they have the handcuffs on them, they take duct, duct tape and wrap it around their eyes and around their wrists, and they lead them into the basement of the museum. And that's a tricky thing to do, to go into an old building. So the Gardner opened in 1903. Because you didn't have two points of egress. If the police are behind you, you're trapped down there. So they're in the basement. They take another set of cuffs and cuff their cuffs to pipes. And they separate them by about 50 yards. Separate the two of them, which is very unusual in a heist. Typically, you want to keep them together so you can check on them more easily. Um, one second here. Once, I'm sorry. If you look at these drawings, you see four guys, right? And the reason there are four is because uh, the guards could not remember or agree on which or if both were wearing fake mustaches. And it sounds hard to believe, but it's true. Eyewitness accounts are very, very difficult, right? And they're unreliable. And if you see from these composites, what they essentially say is that, forget what it's, what's written on the sheets. What, what the guards said was that these guys are around 30, but the guards were in their early 20s at the time. Now they'll say, I thought 30 was old. They could have been 40 or 50, right? Their average height, their average build, they have Boston accents, they're both white guys. One has a round face, the other's got a narrow face. Go find them, right? One had glasses on, one or both of them had a fake mustache. So what these are really useful for is elimination. Right? So we know that the thieves were not people of color. We know that they had local accents. We know, um, and this is actually important, there was always a story that one of the thieves was a guy named David Houghton, but David Houghton was morbidly obese. 
the guards would have remembered that, right? These guys had average build. And um, they weren't women. So that's all you have really to go on. And, but we know that because men commit all the crimes, right? I mean, who, who, who are the serial killers? There have, there have been one or two women, but it's always men. And the same thing is true of art theft. It's always men, except for one woman who I wrote a book about. I think the library has it. So thank you very much. That, I'm so glad you came, Tina. That's why I wanted you to come. So, so next slide. So this is a photo of the guard who let them in, and he's tied up in the basement. So you can see him here, the duct tape all around his face. He's handcuffed behind himself. Um, hand, they, they put duct tape around his ankles. Uh, and when, you know, when the police came, he's been there all night. He has to use the bathroom, but they had to wait for the photographer, right? So he's sitting there. And you think about the difference, right? And now every cop would have an iPhone or, or what have you and take beautiful high-res images and video. Back then, you had to wait for the photographer and hope the photos came out good. The other reason I show you this picture is to remind myself to tell you I was not the security director in 1990, right? So cranberry corduroys, no way. Fashion faux pas would not, would not be allowed. The haircut's not the regulation haircut for a guard either, but um, that's the guy who let them in. Um, do I have to? Yeah, and if you look on the right, that's the basement. I mean, it's a very dark, narrow basement, very difficult to navigate. The lights were off. So what this all tells you, tells us, is that the thieves knew something about the building, right? They had some sort of inside information. And in museum thefts, 80 to 90% of them involve some sort of inside information. So either someone's complicit or loose lips sunk the ship, right? Somebody, somebody told somebody something they shouldn't have. Next slide. Now these are the Rembrandts that were stolen. We have four Rembrandts, and that's not as many as, say, the MFA, but the hallmark of the Gardner Museum is that Mrs. Gardner's collection has special pieces in it, right? So, in the middle is the one most people recognize. That's the storm in the Sea of Galilee. And what's special about that is that it's the only seascape Rembrandt is known to have painted. Think about that. In his whole body of work, he painted one seascape. It's gigantic. It's five feet by four feet. And Mrs. Gardner bought it. It's just like she brought the, the first Raphael to America, the first Matisse, the first Vermeer, um, uh, the first Botticelli. And this is the only known seascape. And on top of that, and you can't make it out, but in this painting, it's the famous biblical scene from the books of Mark and Matthew. And it's Christ just before he stills the water, right? In the painting, the 12 disciples are panicked, just like in the biblical passage. Christ is just waking up. And that's where this whole, you know, have you so little faith comes from. But what makes it remarkable is that there's a 13th disciple, and it's Rembrandt, and he's right here looking right at you. So people would come to the Gardner Museum and get to almost too close to the painting because Rembrandt was right there in the center looking at you as a 13th apostle. That one and the one in the top right-hand corner uh, is a lady and gentleman in black. That's also big. It's about four and a half feet tall by about four feet. Those are the two that were cut from their frames. So most people know the Gardner paintings were cut out of their frame. It's just those two. The cut was not some jagged mess. It was a neat cut along the inside of the frame, the part called the rabe. And, you know, I, I have the stretchers, so if you can, you might know this, you know, the canvas goes around a stretcher, then the stretcher goes on the frame. You could, I have the stretchers, so I can see what the cut looks like. And it's a rectangle, right? It's not perfect, and only I know the shape, so it's like a puzzle piece, right? Um, most people assume that these paintings were rolled because they were cut out, but that's very unlikely. In fact, I'm positive they were not because if you roll a canvas that has been relined, and relining is when to prevent a painting from sagging. See how this one's sagging a little in the top left-hand corner? One of, the, one of the things you do is you take it off the stretcher, you put some sort of glue in the back, in this case, animal glue, and you put another canvas and it just makes it like cardboard, right? So if you try to roll cardboard, you know it's a waste of an effort. And you know paint would flake off. So all we recovered, and I'm going to show you, are very little microscopic flecks of paint. So I do not believe at all that the paintings were rolled. On the top left-hand corner 
is a small Rembrandt, an etching two inches by two inches. Right? And it's a really interesting thing. It's a good lesson about art thieves. So these guys come into the museum. They're coming to steal Rembrandts, first and foremost, just like any of these other heists. And they take a lot of time stealing this little etching. All right? They take it out of its small little frame. They take nine screws out of the back. Now, that etching at the time was worth, I'm guessing, around a quarter million dollars, right? Well beyond a painting I could buy or a piece I could buy. But relative to the pieces in the room, it's insignificant, right? They, they spent all this time stealing this, but next to it is a, um, a, a Durer painting worth millions. And there's a Van Dyck and a Rubens, but the thieves don't touch those because they have no idea who Van Dyck and Rubens are, right? But they know Rembrandt, so they steal this Rembrandt. Next slide, please. Now, I said we have four Rembrandts. They, they tried to take all four. This one here is still at our museum. That's Rembrandt's portrait of the artist as a young man. And again, it's historically important because Rembrandt paints himself as a great master, but at the time, he's still in his hometown of Leiden. He's not yet discovered, but he's painting himself as a great master, right? And it's at this moment that he is discovered by the, print, the Prince of Orange had like a talent scout called Constantine Huygens, and he went out and he found Rembrandt and said, I found an artist as great as all the artists in Italy. And that's when Rembrandt goes to Amsterdam. So it's like this period of time, it's really important. And they take it off the wall. And this next picture here on the right, you can see they lean it facing that chest and forgot it, thank God. So we still have that one. Next slide, please. Now, of the 13 pieces that were stolen, we often say, and you might have read in the newspaper, we say it's a half a billion dollars worth of art, which makes it the biggest theft of anything in the history of the world. But I've been saying 500 million for over 18 years now. It's much more than 500 million dollars. When you think about a, a real turning point was not just the years going by, but I think it was four years ago now that um, Salvador Mundi was sold, the painting that's attributed to um, Leonardo for $450 million, but it's at best, if it's Leonardo at all, it's like a third of his, this is, this is complete Vermeer. This is the most valuable stolen thing in the entire world. And the problem for someone like me that's trying to find it is that, like I'll show this image to police officers, big groups of, of investigators and ask them if they know what it is and they don't, right? But I, but here's the thing, I get that, right? Like I don't want, I live here, I don't want the Worcester, I'm sorry, Winchester police spending their time thinking about art theft, right? I want them doing quality of life crimes in Winchester, keeping the schools safe, that sort of thing, right? So it's my job to try to present this thing to the world and let them, in parking tickets, right? And it's my job to get this thing out there to prosecutors and police officers and do everything we can. We had this up on billboards. I don't know if any of you saw it. Um, we, we participate in all these countless TV shows and such um, because this is the white whale of all the stolen things in the world. Nothing of a higher value in terms of property has ever been stolen. In fact, even the Mona Lisa was famous, but it, it became infinitely more famous because it was stolen in 1911. So this is, the, this is the grand prize. How many, does anybody know how many Vermeers there are? There's 30, what's, what did you say? 36. And um, this is the only one that's missing. And that's about the same number as Leonardo works too. So that there's a good comparison in terms of their rarity. Um, next slide, please. That one was not cut from its frame. It was just taken off this on its stretcher. These are the other works that are stolen, and it's flabbergasting, right? Because I just talked about these major works worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But if these were the only things that were stolen that night, it would still be the biggest, one of the biggest heists in history. So you have up top, you have these f uh, five works by Degas. On the bottom right, you have a painting by um, one of the, um, uh, a student of Rembrandt's, and the thieves stole it thinking it was Rembrandt because um, it wasn't attributed to Govert Flink until our manuals had already been written. Like, so you, if you bought a book at the Gardner in 1990, it said Rembrandt, but it was Govert Flink. 
there's a couple of objects here, a Chinese beaker, oldest thing in the museum from 1200 BC, Shang Dynasty, and a Napoleonic finial that Napoleon's uh, regiment of foot, first regiment of foot would have, and they would carry that. And then in the center is, does anybody recognize that painting? That is Edward Manet, Shea Tartoni. That painting was stolen from the first floor of the museum. So everything else was stolen from the second floor. That was the only thing stolen from the first floor. And interestingly, none of the alarms in the room where it was hung went off that night. So it's a big mystery as to how and when this thing was actually stolen. But I'd like to leave it last because if you take away every painting that was stolen and if it was just one piece that night, this painting, um, we would still be here tonight talking about the great Gardner Heist just for this one work, right? On top of it, though, we have Vermeer and these Rembrandts and such. It gives you a sense of the enormity of the heist. Yep, here's a crime scene photo. That's like a, the nightmare scenario for a, a museum person. These, uh, this here, this big frame on the floor is the one that had the storm in the Sea of Galilee. And you can see they cut it out from the frame, right? And here's the one that held that Govert flink. And in the center is the Vermeer frame. Next slide. This is the only part I can show you to give you an example of how it's cut out, right? So that's the frame. This is the Lady and Gentleman in Black by Rembrandt. And this is the frame. This is the stretcher. This is the frame here, the Rebe, and the stretcher that the canvas was wrapped around. And you can see there's no jagged edges sticking out. Those two ribbons on the top are part of that backing canvas I, I mentioned to you. So you can see it's like a new canvas strip. So there's no jagged edges from the paintings. The painting was cut straight. And if, this, if you could come up close and see the slide, you could actually see the cut. It's like very narrow and deep, which tells me that it was probably a box cutter because you put your weight on top of it and it would be narrow and deep. Next slide. That's what I was mentioning about paint chips. That's an that's a example of a paint chip. You know? I, when I first started, I had a mentor. He's, he's uh, since passed away. His name was Rocky, this big movie character. And he was a retired Scotland Yard in, uh, undercover investigator. He recovered art in Eastern Europe. He recovered these t uh, Turner paintings that were stolen from the Tate Gallery. He's just like a legend. And he had seen a painting that was rolled, and he told me, like, the flakes were big. And you see strips of missing paint when it's unrolled, you know. So we don't believe that happened with ours. So one sec. Just one sec. So the Godner, uh, we're coming up on the 34th anniversary in March, which is astounding. And um, I thought I was going to go to the Godner and find this stuff in five years and, and go do something else. But 18 years later, that's... Uh, my plans have changed. But um, we have a $10 million reward for the art that you, you might have heard about. And the reward is not even for the paintings. It's for information that leads me directly to the art. Right? And it's very important that it's structured that way from a legal point of view. Because museums are loath to, it's unethical to give a reward to thieves. Because right? that's a ransom. And that will provoke other people to steal art. It's a very bad thing to pay thieves for your stolen art. But paying innocent parties who know where the art might be, and that's often how art is recovered. What happens is, famous thing, you know, wives become ex-wives, you know, lovers become ex-lovers, children become estranged. Um, the, the scariest guy in the gang is not so scary anymore, and people are willing to talk, and that's why we believe we know who stole the art. We believe we know who the culprits were, but as I said in the onset, finding the paintings and knowing who took them are drastically different. For instance, I mentioned these Turner paintings stolen from the Tate Gallery. The guys that stole them were arrested immediately. They went to prison and were ultimately released before the paintings were recovered because they didn't know where they were. Right? And that, that's pretty common, believe it or not. So when people ask me, you know, how is the investigation going? Do you think you're going to catch these guys? Well, number one, we're not looking to catch anybody. We're just looking to put paintings back on the wall, right? But number two, it's not a matter of catching the guys. It's a matter of finding the stolen art. And if you look at these paintings in this room, 
And if you took one and I said, hide it somewhere, it wouldn't be hard to hide. And for instance, thieves often, even if they're renting, they'll break a hole in the wall, hide stuff in there, and, and drywall it. You know, so we've done many, many house searches uh, looking for the art, and I've been doing this for so long. When we first started, we'd go to the house and we'd like measure the, we'd get the blueprints and we'd measure the walls to see if anything's been changed. And then we graduated to poking holes in the wall and putting cameras in. And now we have these handheld x-rays that you can just look into the wall. It's much better, <laughs> much better. So uh, last slide. So I mentioned that when I, I was doing the research, I found these 81 Rembrandt heists. And right after my book came out, there was an, an 82nd in Marina del Rey. And this was a tricky one because it was this drawing that was at an exhibition at a hotel. And it's not highly recognizable. And it's not incredibly valuable. I think it was valued at around $200,000. So that's something you, you might be able to sell if, if you steal it. And it was stolen. What we did was I worked with the LA County Sheriff's Office. That's, um, that's their spokesman there. His father was James Arness. Of course, it's LA, right? So of course, his father's. And the LA County Sheriff's Office blasted this image on social media. So it became recognizable to the world instantly. And then I was on the media in LA, and I kept saying the same thing over and over. I say, I have a message for the thieves. If you've stolen this, you've not stolen a picture, you've stolen a problem. Leave it somewhere, tell the authorities where it is, and hope this whole thing goes away, because it can only get you in trouble. And on the third day after the theft, they left it at a church in Marina del Rey, notified the pastor, and they got the peace back. And I tell you the story because that's how, that's almost like an Amber Alert for art. It has to be the right situation, right? That's why Amber Alerts aren't every day. It has to be the right situation, and this was one of them, you know? If we could go back in time and look at the way the Godner theft happened in 1990 and the tools that are available now as opposed to then, right? Just, just cameras alone, right? We would have all these video views of the car taking off, of the car going up and down the street. You could follow it on the toll booths and on uh, uh, you name it. It, it not, but then there was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. And even the best cameras on buildings were fuzzy black and white images that you couldn't really see. So last slide. So um, as a reminder, this talk was based on my book, Stealing Rembrandts. I know it's here at the library, but if you read it from the library, I don't get royalties. So <laughs> um, I don't know if the bookstore has it. it. Drives me nuts when they don't have my, but I know you can get it online. Um, I appreciate you coming out. I know it's cold. And uh, when I'm walking home tonight, I'll, I'll feel that cold. But um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, including questions about the Godner. But of course, the Godner questions have to be, you know, I can't reveal too much. I, I, but I thank you for coming out, and I appreciate your understanding with the questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So have you recovered any art other than the one you just mentioned yeah. during the time frame? And has anything been stolen during that time frame? Could you hear that question? Yeah. Good. So I like that question. So in over 18 years, nothing has been lost or we have, no, we have zero losses to the collection in, in my 18 years. So we have, we have very good security at the Gardner Museum. And I mentioned I did the security at Logan after 9-11 and the Godner. So one benefit I've had in my career is when I ask for something, nobody says no to me, right? I, I know what we need to do. And um, I give the credit to the board and to the leadership at the museum. If I, if I put up a camera tomorrow and then next month say, you know what, there's a better one now, they'll buy it, they'll do it. And, and we have the best stuff. But we're the only museum you'll find that has a guard in every room. We have a live set of eyes on everything. Right? And we're very serious about our security, as you can imagine, at the Gardner Museum. So no. In my time looking for art, um, I've recovered, it's something like 74 pieces plus a bunch of ethnographic art. Um, the last thing I recovered was a painting 
that was stolen from a major university in Massachusetts, who I can't name, and before that was something stolen from a major university in Rhode Island. The thing is, is like if I, if, whenever I recover something, it's because I'm talking to someone about my thing. And they're like, well, I, can, I know where this is or that is. So you're hired by other institutions or places? I'm hired by a lot of institutions to do a lot of different things, but the recoveries are always, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you one instance where there was a guy that I worked with for a matter of months and had to meet him in like the most disgusting places all the time, and uh, he, was, he was scared. And he had works that were stolen by a gang we were looking at and he had never looked at them. And it turned out not to be ours, but it looked like ours, like it was wrapped up and we thought this was the moment, and you rip it open, and it's other paintings. And I love art, but if, if I think I'm going to get the Gardner paintings and instead I get a Van Gogh, I'm like, hey, yeah, Van Gogh, mm. <laughs> great. Because I just want these, you know? So I don't really think about those as much. Yes? Yep. Just because they wanted to have them. I believe they was, the Gardner paintings were stolen for money. I believe that, like in all these other heists, when they woke up the next morning and saw the newspaper, they probably thought it was going to say $5 million, and the newspaper said $200 million back then, and instantly realized that this was worldwide front page news, and how are you going to sell them? So they're sitting on something they know they can't sell for third or four years. They can't just leave the church next door and tell the priest. There's a, there's a lot of variables that you know, we don't know the answer to, but there's a lot of different, I have to be careful, but um, there's a lot of different scenarios which make it difficult to return things. One scenario, I'm not being coy, it's just a scenario, would be suppose Bev and I went and stole some art. I I had two of the pieces, she had two of the pieces. Bev and I are not going to steal it. I just met Bev, right? So, but imagine if we did, right? And there was a big reward for them. And we're both very dangerous people. And I decide I want that reward. I have to tell Bev I'm going to turn my paintings in. Bev is, there's a good chance she's going to kill me. So I don't want to tell Bev. I can't just go do it because Bev's going to know they came from me. Bev's going to worry that's going to lead to her. So when you have 13 pieces, that's one scenario. That's positive. And I'm not, again, I swear, I'm not being coy. I'm not hinting. Could be, but I don't, I don't know if that's the case. That's just one possibility. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of possibilities. Yes? How far away do you usually, or you, you said you track how far paintings are recovered? Is it usually pretty close? Typically, paintings are stolen, especially in the United States. They're, they're recovered like in a 60-mile radius. Paintings stolen in the United States don't go overseas. It's incredibly rare. I can't think of an instance off the top of my head because in America, if you steal a painting in Boston and you want to shop it, you have 320 million Americans and you have 50 states, right? And you can travel those 50 states without going through customs. If you want to bring it to Ireland, you're going to go through customs maybe twice, right? And there's a thing out there that people think the IRA have our paintings. The IRA, they do not have our paintings. They didn't do it. It was an American crime, and I believe the paintings are here. So there's always an outlier, right? That's why I gave that example. It's never women who steal paintings, but there was one, so you can't rule anything out. Yes, sir. What does the fencing side of the equation look like? If they're provided with an opportunity, where do they get rid of the paintings and how do they? They don't. So the paintings that get fenced would be these. Or if you went to Newbury Street and you stole 20 lithographs by Moreau, or if you stole even like a, I always give the example like a Hudson River Valley landscape, those things are very, very expensive. They're not millions, but they're very expensive but they're, they're not as recognizable because they're all landscapes, right? And the artist's names are not household names. That's something you might be able to sell. Not through an auction house, though, because that would be in a database. So 
maybe a private sale. Yes, sir. Um, one of my favorite documentaries of last year was uh, Tomic, who is the Paris Spider Man who stole. Oh, yeah, things. yeah. Um, I was wondering with how you're talking about back then, it was kind of easy to do. In 2010, with all of the technology and all the security things, he was able to get away with it. Mm -hmm. Got arrested, but they never found him. Um, what kind of measures could they have taken or now can take? To well, it's tough. Happen? It's tough to talk about measures because one of the one of the um, uh, tricky parts of securing. Well, one of the tricky parts about talking about museum security is that museums aren't regulated, right? It's not like an airport where every airport has to have a certain standard. <clears throat> There's government inspectors. If I open a museum tomorrow and I populate it with a billion pieces of art, a billion, billion dollars worth of art, I don't even have to put locks in the doors. There's no law that says I have to do, so every museum does it their own way, right? And um, nobody comes and inspects to say, hey, your, your motion sensors are down or, the alarm in that area is not working. So all you can do, the, what you have to do is, is um, in a nutshell, you have to, it's a philosophical thing, and the philosophy is building layers of security around what you're trying to secure, right? When the Gardner theft happened, when the thieves came in, there was one layer of security, those doors. Once the thieves were in, it was over, right? What you want to do is build in redundancies of security. So, okay, I got in the door, now I have to get past this and I have to get past that. I have to get to the work. How do I get it off the wall? Is it gonna alarm? Now I have to get back out, right? Um, so you have m many, many layers of security built in now. You can't, you have to make sure that one mistake is not catastrophic. And, and that's the over, overall philosophy that you would use. The technology is secondary, it's like, it, you use the technology to build on your concentric rings of whether you're protecting art or the president or this library or a school. Yes? Um, so you said the one on the first floor, there was no alarm. No alarm went off, right. Did an alarm go off for the second floor? Mm-hmm. The alarms went, but the alarms are all internal. Oh. So, so the alarms would just go into the computer at the watch desk and there was nobody there. And it just keeps saying, okay. someone is in the Dutch room, investigate immediately. Okay. Now, People say, well, why didn't your alarms go to the police? Because if they did, every time a mouse ran through a building in Boston, the police would have to respond, right? Because the motion sensor went off. So it's, it's, it just doesn't work that way. So you need to have humans monitoring your alarm system. And again, that was 1990. Nowadays, we know everything that happens. It all goes to my phone. Yep. No. So the question, if you couldn't hear the question, had to do is it, is it, does it ever happen that some billionaire has these, these pieces like art like this in their underground lair? And the answer is no. There's no, I mean, again, you never know, right? But there's never been an example. And the, way, the beginning of this book, I think the first chapter is There Is No Dr. No. So if you've heard of the movie Dr. No, it was the first Bond film. I think it was 1962. The movies are based on the books by um, Ian Fleming, thank you. But there's a scene in Dr. No that's not in the book. And what happened was when they were making the movie, a famous painting in England was stolen. It was the Duke of Wellington. And there's a movie about this on Netflix, I think. Duke of Wellington gets stolen, right? And nobody knows where the heck it is. It's a big deal. It's a very valuable painting. Um, the world is wondering where this painting is. So in the movie, James Bond is in Dr. No's underground lair, and when he's leading him off to dinner, he walks by that painting on an easel, and James Bond looks at it as if to say, like, oh, that's where it is, right? But as if you see this movie called The Duke, you'll learn that painting was stolen by a unemployed bus driver, elderly guy, a pensioner, who was upset with the tax he had to pay for his BBC. You have to pay a TV tax. And he took that painting and wanted to hold it ransom. You know, it's the complete opposite of this evil billionaire, right? It never happens, but, but does that mean if someone called me tomorrow and said, you know, 
first of all, this is Massachusetts, so people always say it's the Koch brothers. Right? Oh, it must be, must be Republicans who stole that painting. But then again, I have people who are convinced JFK Jr. stole them, Ted Kennedy stole them, I stole them because I'm Italian-American, so I must be committed, connected to the mafia. So you get all of those theories. But, but that's the unlikeliest scenario because it just never happens. People with that much money buy their own paintings. They want to show them off. They don't want to hide them. Yes, sir. Uh, could you maybe explain why you think they took some of the outer pieces, like the finial? Sure. That's a good question. So the thieves came to the museum to steal the Rembrandts, right? And we know this because they come into the museum, they go directly to, the, after, when they start stealing things, an interesting point is, I told you about this database, right? If you made a normal curve of all the art heists in the last 100 years, they'll, the normal curve will be three to nine minutes. The Gardner theft was 81 minutes. They didn't start stealing anything for 24 minutes. That's how comfortable they were in our building. But when they start stealing, they go directly to the Dutch room for the Rembrandts of the Vermeer. They take the stuff down together, and the motion sensor data tells me then one of the guys, once they're down, one of the guys goes freelancing, and five times he goes into a room called the Short Gallery where he takes these Degas and the Finial. And these, the Degas, I think, back then were probably worth around $2 million. An arm's length down in another cabinet is a Michelangelo drawing and a Raphael drawing, and Bronzino, and about a half a dozen Matisse drawings. Like, holy Toledo. And they didn't touch those, because he doesn't know. They didn't have labels on them. He wouldn't know them from Adam, right? But the Degas had racehorses in them. And it's, again, I'm not giving you some wink-wink thing, but it's likely that the guy liked racehorses, and he took these Degas. So Dutch room aside, the rest of the stuff seems to be sort of like trophy pieces. Mm. Yes, sir. I know there are rules about not changing things in the museum. Um, mm -hmm. Mrs. Gardner didn't want things to change, but are you still not able to put up other works where those works were? No. Down? Great point. I didn't mention. So some of you might know the Gardner Museum, when Mrs. Gardner passed away, her will was the first of its kind, and it said nothing can ever be changed. It, I think the words are the general disposition of the art must remain exactly as she left it. You can't take away from it. You cannot add to it. And the example I like to give is where the Vermeer is, if the Louvre said to us, we feel bad, here's the Mona Lisa. Put it there until you get the, the Vermeer back. We'd have to say, we can't do it. We can't put anything else there. If we change it, the will says the entire collection has to be auctioned off and all the proceeds given to Harvard. Um, <laughs> Because Harvard was all there was back then, essentially, right? But I don't think they need the money. But we're very fastidious about making sure nothing, nothing gets changed. We, you know, we go in, and if the chair goes like that, and we do that. And if you walk by and you kick the chair by mistake, conservator comes running upstairs, checks the chair with white gloves, puts it back where it's supposed to be. And um, we take it seriously, because that's what she wanted. Say that again? That's what, yeah, that's what, well, you know, the, um, the Harvard Lampoon, more than a decade ago, they, they were having a, an event at the Gardner, and they said, hey, we want to bring in copies of the stolen paintings and, and present them as if we stole them. We said, you know, we don't, no, we're, we're a crime victim. We prefer you not to make fun of it when you come here. And they, and they brought paintings, and we, but we didn't let them do it, and they, they're not invited back, suffice it to say. Any other questions before we uh, let you go back into the cold night? Yes? For those people who haven't been there, the Worcester Museum has a marvelous exhibit. Which one do they have now? The Rembrandt. Oh, yeah, etchings. That's right. You know, and I joke about Worcester all the time, but that museum is great. It's really awesome I museum. Was down, I was just there on Saturday. It's and beautiful, right? There are like 70 or 80 of his etchings, and they are only going to be shown in Worcester and Quebec, and then they go in storage for 10 years. Ten years. Because the museum back home is under renovation. But they allow them these out, but only to two places, Worcester and Quebec. Well, you know, one of the things is a lot of museums have their exhibition schedules years in advance. They're planned. So a lot of museums might. And then also, you know, there might be places that want them that don't have the security level that a place is willing to share them. Did anybody get to see the Titian exhibition at the Gardner? 
That was unbelievable. No, that was incredible. That was the first time those pieces were together in 500 years, and they'll never be together again. We'll never, we're not going to ever loan the Titian. And that was the highlight for, for me. My one braggy moment was I got to walk Mick Jagger through, <laughs> through the thing. And I was just like, the whole time he's asking me all these questions, and I'm, and I'm answering him, but all I'm thinking is, you're Mick Jagger. <laughs> You're Mick Jagger. That's all I could think of my head is like, you're Mick Jagger. So they will let you put up a, a, a separate room okay. outside in the, in the new building. Uh, so one last question. Is there any concern about, you said like they stored on a pig farm and one painting, the, the, the condition the paintings would be in that were to be recovered? Well, do these criminals tend to keep them in reasonably good condition or are they often found totally deteriorated? That's a great question. So it's about like the condition, you know, they've been gone for 34 years. And what's interesting, a couple of parts of that. Number one, older paintings like ours, I spend a lot of time with the paintings conservators. Older paintings like the Rembrandts, for instance, they, um, they become pretty stable after a very long period of time. People always say, oh, those paintings are ruined because they're not in climate control. They haven't been in climate control for 34 years. Well, they weren't in climate control until 1994 when we got climate control, right? For 300 years before that, and for hundreds of years, they, you know, it's in Amsterdam, people are smoking pipes and the sun's blasting on them and there's a fireplace. Um, so I'm not worried about that so much. I only think about getting them back because I've seen these paintings conservatives do magic, right? The, the guy who's at the Gardner Museum, he was telling me one time about he had this painting, an oil painting, on a wooden panel, and he removed the paint and put it on a canvas. And when he told me that, I said, that's all I need to know. You can fix it, right? But in Stealing Rembrandts, I tell the story about um, a painting attributed to Rembrandt at the de Young Museum in California that was stolen called Portrait of a Rabbi, and it was missing for, I, I want to say, 25 years, give or take. And the thieves couldn't sell it and they gave it back. They shipped it to a gallery. Gallery opens this crate, and there's a portrait of a rabbi. But they had stored it in such bad condition that mold grew between the canvas and the paint. Um, but they repaired it. It's perfectly fine. Then the museum found out it's not really Rembrandt, and now it's in storage. So after all of that, <laughs> after all of that mishigas, but the one, one last one I'll tell you is I'm fascinated. The thing that keeps me interested in this stuff is outliers, right? So all of these things fall in the normal curve. I like the ones that, like the Miles Connor, who stole art so many times, or the woman stole Vermeer. There's a painting that was stolen from the University of Arizona in 1985 by Willem de Koning. And the theft is just an amazing theft to me. It's the day after Thanksgiving. It's a co Has anybody been there? University of Arizona Museum? I went there for the return of this painting, right? For the, I gave this lecture. The theft happens like this. It's the morning after Thanksgiving. It's just before the museum's about to open. And these husband and wife are waiting at the door. And it's like two minutes before opening, literally. People are coming to work. And don't forget, we're talking about five people working, right? There's college kids and two guards. So they see these people there, guys coming into work, and they say to the couple, you can come in too. You can wait here in the lobby. Guards start, they tell the guards, okay, go to your gallery. And the people follow the guard. The wife on the staircase stops the guard and asks him about this big, unbelievable, modern piece of art. And he's answering the question, and the husband goes ahead. Husband and wife walk out rapidly, like a minute later. The guy gets upstairs. He notices that the Koenig has been cut from its frame. And no one has any idea where this painting is. And it's just gone. And they're not looking for it. And then in around 2000. 11, no, I take that back, 2015, University of Arizona decides, let's advertise, let's, let's put this in the news, what can it hurt? I mean, it's been going for 30 years, right? They make a news story of it, they have the empty frame on the wall, sort of like us, you know, to, make, to raise people's awareness. Nothing happens. Two years later, a woman in New Mexico passes away. Her husband had died before her. They were both like school teachers. The woman dies, a state sale company comes in, buys everything. They put up this painting in their antique store, and people are coming in and saying, 
that thing looks like something. What is that? And they, nobody knows. And finally, they Google it, and they see these news stories from two years earlier, and it's just a Kooning painting worth $110 million. They had cut it out and rolled it, and the, the couple, and they tried to conserve it themselves, and they glued it to a piece of cardboard. So I've seen pictures of how it was recovered. It looked terrible, but it's, it looks perfectly fine now. But they got it back, and, no, it, and it was this couple, and that never happens. People never steal paintings for themselves, but it happened once. But, even better. It's in the bedroom, good memory, right? But it's behind the door, so like if you walked in their bedroom, you wouldn't see it. When they went to bed and shut the door, there's the de Kooning, <laughs> woman ochre. And it's on the wall, and it's $110 million, and this couple just sold it, um, stole it. And when they, people didn't even believe it could possibly be them. But one of their family members found a picture of them in Arizona on Thanksgiving, 1985 and they stole that painting. It's incredible, it's incredible. Good, all right, so that's the questions, that's the talk. Oh, one last one, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. That's okay. Um, I didn't know until you said how um, economically, uh, like proportionally it's effective to, or, um, okay, so like, would there, it's so economically important, it's so valuable, these paintings. Could there ever be legislation that would um, have you connected to the NSA or something like that? Because, I mean, just imagine the economic activity of like, then people would come visit Boston, the hotels, the restaurants, the Isabella, the MFA is so close by, Fenway, the Red Sox. I mean, it's uh, like people would travel all over the world to see this. Well, they do. Um, especially if you got it back, it would be. Oh, be insane. So I worry about that. So when I started at the Gardner, we had about 210,000 visitors a year, which is a lot. I mean, it's not, the rooms are smallish, and now we have 420,000. We have doubled our attendance. We, that's why if you go, we, get, we do time ticketing, because we just can't fit people anymore. It's unbelievable. And that would be a real problem. Like when we get these paintings back, it's like, how are we going to present? Uh, we don't even talk about it. It's like, how will we present these to the world? Because it's going to be mayhem. Um, Interpol gets involved in this sort of stuff, but it's not like, again, it's not like the movies. Interpol doesn't have investigators. They're not out looking for paintings. It's an information resource. The FBI, of course, is involved. Every state and local agency that we need helps us when we need them, need them to. Um, people do understand the economic import of them, but much more important is the cultural patrimony. I mean, these things are, you have to remember when Rembrandt painted Storm in the Sea of Galilee, there, was no, there were no iPads. Right? And that's the image you're going to see. Right? I always love this. Sorry, I'm going on and on, but this is in my second book, I did this research about this fraud involving a George Washington painting. And you don't think about it, but George Washington was the most famous person in the world after the revolution. But nobody knew what he looked like, except people who knew him. So getting a painting of George Washington. So sometimes you go to an antique store, you'll see like a drawing of him, and you're like, that doesn't look like him, because people are drawing based on descriptions. Right, because all you had was Gilbert Stewart, really. Right? And um, well, who was the other one? Rembrandt Peale did him too, I think. Imagine in the 1600s, you know, the value of these paintings. So, thank you, folks. I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Beth.